and join us there or just hit the numbers 1-800-439-5732 to help us make our goal of 3000 we could do it we could still do it we're at 1900 now but we need your help oh i got to go KPFA, KPFB, Berkeley, 88.1, KFC up in Fresno. Good evening. It's Friday, May 13th. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin finally gets Moscow to pick up his call as he talks to Russia's Minister of Defense in the highest level contact with the Kremlin since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in late February. The German Chancellor speaks today with Russian President Vladimir Putin by telephone. Meanwhile, Ukraine launches its first war crimes trial of a Russian soldier accused of shooting to death a civilian during the war's first week. The captured 21-year-old sergeant stands accused in Ukrainian court of shooting a 62-year-old man in the head, and he faces up to life in prison. Turkey's President Erdogan declares he's not inclined to let Finland and Sweden join NATO, indicating Turkey could use its membership in the Western Military Alliance to veto moves to admit the two countries. California Governor Gavin Newsom pledges to use the state's record-breaking $300 billion budget, including an unprecedented nearly $100 billion surplus, to future-proof the state from the impacts of a volatile midterm election cycle that he fears will undermine abortion access, gun safety, and privacy protections across the country. Newsom today presents his revised budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Israeli riot police push and beat pallbearers at the funeral for slain Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akla, causing them to briefly drop her casket in a shocking start to a procession that turned into perhaps the largest display of Palestinian nationalism in Jerusalem in a generation. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi today kicks off the weekend of abortion rights protests, pledging to counter efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Russia's Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, spoke with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin today after months of refusing direct contact with his American counterpart. But officials said the call did not appear to signal any change in Moscow's war in Ukraine. The call, initiated by Austin, marked the highest level American contact with a Russian official since the war began in late February. Over the past several months, Pentagon officials Officials have repeatedly said that Russian leaders declined to take calls from Austin and Army General Mark Milley, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Nick Harper reports. There's been no contact since the start of the war in Ukraine, even though the U.S. says it has been trying various channels of communication. The Pentagon said that Secretary Austin urged an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine and emphasized the importance of maintaining lines of communication. In turn, the Kremlin issued a statement saying the two men discussed topical international security issues, including the situation in Ukraine. I'm Nick Harper in Washington. The Ukrainian army said said in its daily operational statement today that the Russian army continued its strategic offensive in the country's east, attacking new towns and villages. Russian troops were engaging their Ukrainian opponents with live fire near the strategic city of Severodonetsk in Ukraine's Donbass, the Ukrainian military's general staff said in a Facebook post published on its official profile. Analysts say that fighting in that area is critical to securing control over the Donbass, Ukraine's eastern industrial heartland, which is made up of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions.
Meanwhile, British military officials say the heavy losses suffered recently by a column of Russian armor demonstrate the pressure Moscow's military commanders are under to make progress in eastern Ukraine. The UK Ministry of Defense today confirmed news reports that Ukrainian forces prevented the Russian column from crossing the Sivirsky Donetsk River west of Severodonetsk on a pontoon bridge. The ministry said Russia lost significant elements of at least one battalion tactical group, as well as equipment used to quickly deploy the floating bridge. The ministry said conducting river crossings in a contested environment is a highly risky maneuver and speaks to the pressure that the Russian commanders are under to make progress in their operations in eastern Ukraine. The ministry said Russia has failed to make any significant advances despite concentrating forces in the Luhansk and Donbass regions of eastern Ukraine after withdrawing troops from other areas of Ukraine. The European Union's foreign affairs chief says the EU is giving Ukraine another $520 million to buy heavy weapons to fend off the Russian invasion. Joseph Borrell said the funds would take the bloc's total financial support for Ukraine to more than $2 billion. He also expressed hope of getting the bloc's member nations to agree to an oil embargo against Russia despite misgivings from some European countries. Borrell spoke before a meeting of top diplomats from the group of seven wealthy nations today. Rosie Burchard reports from Brussels. Burrell says the money will be allocated to heavy weapons. However, he doesn't have the final say. This is a proposal, and a political and technical agreement is still needed among all 27 EU member states before the funds can start flowing. EU foreign ministers are expected to discuss the matter at a meeting on Monday, where they'll be joined by their Ukrainian and Canadian counterparts. Rosie Burchard, Brussels. Ukraine's prosecutor general said today that her office is readying 41 war crimes cases against Russian soldiers. In a live briefing on Ukrainian television this evening, Irina Venedik, Kova said she has 41 suspects in cases in which she'll be ready to go to court, all of them concerning Article 438 of the Criminal Code on War Crimes. But different types of war crimes, she said there's the bombing of civilian infrastructure, the killing of civilians, rape and looting. It was not immediately clear how many of the Russian soldier suspects would be tried in absentia. Today marked the first war crime prosecution of a member of the Russian military in Kiev as a 21-year-old Russian soldier went on trial for the killing of an unarmed Ukrainian civilian in the early days of the war. The soldier, a captured member of a tank unit, is accused of shooting a 62-year-old Ukrainian man in the head through an open car window in a northeastern village. Scores of journalists and cameras packed inside a small courtroom in a district court in Ukraine's capital, where the suspect, Sergeant Vadim Shashimarin, sat in a glassed-off area wearing a blue and gray hoodie, sweat plants, and a shaved head. He faces up to life in prison under a section of the Ukrainian Criminal Code that addresses the laws and customs of war. The hearing in the case was brief. A judge asked the soldier to provide his name, address, marital status, and other identifying details. He was also asked whether he understood his rights, quietly replying yes, and if he wanted a jury trial, which he declined. The judges and lawyers discussed procedural matters before the judges left the courtroom and then returned to say the case would continue on May 18th. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said today that his country is not favorable toward Finland and Sweden joining NATO indicating Turkey might use its membership in the Western Military Alliance to veto moves to admit the two countries. The Turkish leader explained his opposition by citing Sweden and other Scandinavian countries' alleged support for Kurdish militants and others whom Turkey considers to be terrorists. 
He said he also did not want to repeat Turkey's past mistake from when it agreed to readmit Greece into NATO's military wing back in 1980. He claimed that action had allowed Greece to take an attitude against Turkey with NATO's backing. Erdogan did not say outright that he would block any accession attempts by the two Nordic nations. However, NATO makes all its decisions by consensus, meaning that each of the 30 member countries has the potential to veto over who else can join. Russia's invasion of Ukraine prompted Finland and Sweden to reconsider their traditions of military non-alignment. Public opinion in the two countries quickly started to shift toward favoring NATO membership after Russia invaded February 24th. Should the two countries proceed on that path, it would represent a blow to Russia since President Putin cited NATO's expansions near Russian territory as one of his justifications for invading Ukraine. Reporter Simon Marks says more. At a stroke, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has achieved something that has long proved elusive for the transatlantic alliance, getting Sweden and Finland on board in place of their long-held neutrality. Alexander Stubb is the former Prime Minister of Finland, and he told FSN's Brussels correspondent Rosie Burchard why he thinks NATO and Finland will go hand in glove. It's a win-win proposition, I think, uh, for security in the Baltic Sea region, for security for the alliance and security in Europe. You see, Finland might be bringing in a long land border with Russia, 1,340 kilometers, but it also brings in a reserve of uh, 900,000 men and women, capacity to mobilize 280,000 for wartime within days. It brings in 62 F-18 fighter jets and soon 64 F-35s plus all the defense mechanisms linked to it. The Swedes are very strong in the air and on the ground. Both of us are very good on cyber. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's really a win-win proposition. That's why I think NATO member states will uh, welcome us with open arms. And those arms are indeed open. NATO's Secretary General, Jen Stoltenberg, said yesterday, accession will be swift and smooth. Simon Marks reporting. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke with Russian President Putin by phone today, the first time the two have spoken since late March. That's according to a German government spokesman. The 75-minute call today focused on the ongoing war in Ukraine and efforts to end it. Schultz urged Putin to reach a ceasefire agreement with Ukraine as soon as possible and to improve the humanitarian situation on the ground. The spokesman said the German leader also clearly rejected the Kremlin accusation that Nazism was widespread in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign minister said today his country remains willing to engage in diplomatic talks with Russia to unblock grain supplies and to achieve a political solution to the war. But Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said his country won't accept ultimatums from Moscow. Kuleba told reporters in Germany on the sidelines of a meeting today of top diplomats from the group of seven major economies that Kiev has received no positive feedback from Russia. He said the Kremlin prefers wars to talks. California Governor Gavin Newsom has unveiled his revised state budget proposal, flush with nearly $100 billion in a projected budget surplus. Newsom's plans for the money include ambitious spending programs, but he's warning the state's economy will also feel effects of the war in Ukraine, with higher food and energy costs and supply chain disruptions. Christopher Martinez filed this report. Governor Gavin Newsom's new budget proposal, known as the May Revise, opens with a list of challenges facing the state. From the COVID-19 pandemic to the Russian war in Ukraine and related inflation and energy costs. But when Newsom presented his plan Friday morning, he lost little time getting to the good news. Here's the number you've been waiting for, this surplus. Projected operating surplus for the state of California uh, in the May revisions, just shy of 100 billion dollars simply without precedent no other state 
in American history has ever experienced a surplus as large as this. Newsom's budget proposal totals a record $300.7 billion, but the surplus alone is larger than most state budgets and close to twice what the earlier budget plan projected. Newsom is planning to use that money on one-time projects, chief among them dealing with inflation. What are we going to do to ease that stress, ease that burden? And that's why we're proposing $18.1 billion to put back in the pockets of millions and millions, tens of millions of Californians. The plan would send $400 checks to everyone who owns a car. Democratic lawmakers have proposed smaller amounts targeted to low-income households, while Republicans prefer tax-related actions like suspending the gasoline tax and increasing some other tax credits. But Newsom, who had announced his plan a day earlier, defends his approach. Our rebate is across the spectrum. For you, it could be a rebate to address the issue of groceries. It could be a rebate to address the other cost burdens are placed on you. It's a simple tax refund. It could be a gas refund. Whatever it is, it's inflation uh, refund and relief. Along with that rebate for car owners, Newsom is proposing $750 million for mass transit to provide free bus and rail for three months. The budget also includes new funding for housing and homelessness programs, like $500 million to turn malls and storefronts into housing, and tiny homes for quick shelter options. And Newsom again takes on the climate change issue, with a $32 billion increase in his budget request. California environmental voters, formerly known as California League of Conservation Voters, notes the funding is a clear increase from Newsom's January proposal, but they say better does not mean enough. Enviro voters want $75 billion over five years, saying we won't get a second chance to save California. Newsom's budget also keeps an eye on reproductive rights, especially in light of the now likely event the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. Unenumerated rights, going back to 1780. Uh, is it interracial marriage next? Well, that's the senator from Indiana who says perhaps. Or is it gay marriage? Well, that's probably two-thirds of Republican senators. Or uh, is it contraception? That may be what the Mississippi governor was unable to answer as it relates to IUDs, Plan B, and other contraceptives. That's the world we're living in. While Republicans take a very different approach to the state budget, the large Democratic majorities in the legislature means the real negotiations will come between Newsom and Democratic leaders. And there, Newsom says there's little difference in goals, and the details can be worked out before the June 15th deadline to pass the budget. Still, it won't necessarily be all rosy. Newsom says he's mindful of the vulnerabilities ahead, geopolitically and politically in general. The polarization that persists in this nation impacts midterm elections may have in California in our future, impacts 2024 may have on our fate and future, impacts the Supreme Court not just on reproductive rights but on gun policy and privacy issues may have on our fate and future, and we're doing everything we can to future-proof California. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Groups that fight food insecurity have been meeting this week with every California state lawmaker as part of Hunger Action Week. Suzanne Potter reports. It's Hunger Action Week and activists are asking lawmakers to use California's wealth for the people's health and harness the budget surplus to battle food insecurity. Advocates hope to phone and Zoom with all 120 members of the State Assembly and Senate. Their top priority is the Food for All bill, which would extend CalFresh food assistance to undocumented people of all ages. Frank Tamborello is executive director of Hunger Action LA. With the double hit of food price inflation, coupled with an expected reduction in public benefits due to the pandemic emergency being lifted pretty soon, it's a critical moment to shake up our legislators and show them that they need to use the state surplus to alleviate the continued suffering. Pandemic-induced poverty has not abated. Statistics show that one in five Californians still struggle with food insecurity. Governor Gavin Newsom's budget proposal would put $50 million toward the Cal Food Program, which helps food banks to purchase California-grown foods. Becky Silva with the California Association of Food Banks says she hopes it gets bumped up to $120 million in the May 15th budget revise. A lot of our food banks are still saying that they're serving double the number of people, sometimes even triple the number of people pre-pandemic. 
Wes Saber with the Glide Center for Social Justice in San Francisco would like the state to implement a planned increase for SSI recipients in 2023 instead of 2024. Despite the federal and state interventions, food insecurity in California remains with really deep inequities in communities of color. Uh, More than a quarter of black and Latinx families reported food insecurity, which is double the rate of white families. Todd Cunningham is a Skid Row organizer for the L.A. Community Action Network. He says this year, people actually experiencing homelessness will be on the Zoom calls with legislators. Folks who may never have had the opportunity to go to Sacramento in the past can now speak about their lived experiences. The people who are living day to day with the issues make the great impact. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. And it's no frills news tonight here on this Friday evening on the Pacifica Evening News. No frills, no bells and whistles. We're not selling any books. We're not selling any CDs or videos. Nope, there's no matching fund. There's no special gifts. There's nothing special. There's nothing. It's austerity night. It's austerity night on the news. All we got is, guess what? The news. (laughs) That's it. That's all we got to give you. Of course, it is the same thing we give you every night of the week at this hour. But overlooking that fact... We're asking 20 of you tonight to support Just The News. Just The News. Here's we wrap up the first day of the fun drive at KPFK in Los Angeles. It's the, we're wrapping up the second week of the fun drive here at KPFA in Berkeley in Northern and Central California. We're wrapping up the first week of the fun drive. We're asking for your financial support for just the news. We ain't got anything else to give you tonight. So if we can get 20 of you to donate whatever you can donate for just the news, the No Frills News, we'll consider it a great accomplishment. Maybe this is a little too hardcore for you. Well, that's kind of the nature of the news It's kind of depressing if you think about it, but don't think about it. Think about the information, the value you get from the news and perspectives that this radio station brings to you and this newscast tries to contribute to. If that's valuable to you, please help us support Just the News by giving us a call in Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. Three two, or going online at kpfa.org. kpfa.org, 1-800-439-5732. And if you're listening in Southern California, the number to call, 818-985-5735, 818-985-5735. The online address is kpfk.org, kpfk.org. For Southern California listeners, 818-985-5735, the number to call. We're looking for 20 of you to support Just The News tonight. By the time we get to the end of this newscast, which continues right now. Nationwide student walkouts took place yesterday in protest of the anticipated rollback of abortion rights across the country. Youth walked out of class in Seattle. Thousands took to the streets in New York City. It comes after a leaked draft Supreme Court opinion that overturns the landmark abortion rights ruling Roe v. Wade. Activists across the U.S. are staging die-ins today. Nationwide protests slated to happen tomorrow. 
Washington, D.C., other major cities across the country, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi kicked off that weekend of abortion rights protests, pledging to counter efforts to overturn Roe v. Wade. She spoke during an event held on the Capitol steps that included California Democratic Representatives Barbara Lee and Judy Chu, Carolyn Maloney of New York, and Veronica Escobar of Texas. KPFA's Avery Luke reports. Democrats say they vow to fight the decision if finalized and continue pushing for abortion rights legislation. California lawmaker Judy Chu is author of the Women's Health Protection Act, a bill proposed to codify Roe v. Wade into law. Chu responded to Republican criticism of the bill, which was voted down by the Senate earlier this week. She addressed the two pro-choice Republicans who voted against the legislation because they said the bill went too far. You know what goes too far? It's the actual Republican agenda com to completely outlaw abortion in every state of the union. Yeah, a federal ban. And that is why people are galvanized. That is why people are marching. This is not the end of the process. This is the beginning. Pelosi said that Republicans across the nation are mobilizing around a dangerous and extreme agenda that will criminalize all forms of reproductive health care. Some Republican lawmakers plan to outlaw access to reproductive services such as in vitro fertilization, contraception, and post-miscarriage care. To the Supreme Court, to the Republicans in Congress, to state governments across the country, we, fully, we want you to know we fully intend to protect Roe v. Wade, and we will be doing it every single day to protect those who seek care and those who provide care. Demonstrations have taken place throughout the country since the draft decision became public. Overturning Roe would probably dramatically restrict access to reproductive related health services for women in red states like Texas, which already has extremely limited access to abortion. Many of those states already have so-called trigger laws on their books that would ban almost all abortions within 30 days when Roe v. Wade is overturned. In some cases, doctors could face life in prison and fines up to $100,000 if they violated the law. Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, who represents Texas's 16th Congressional District, gave a dire warning about the future of reproductive rights. We have seen very clearly what Republicans' vision for America is, and it is a very dark vision. In the uh, radical rights vision for America, we stand to lose access to freedoms and fundamental civil rights. They have made that clear. They have told us who they are, and they have shown us what they want. With more than two dozen states planning to ban abortion if Roe v. Wade is overturned, California has positioned itself as a sanctuary state for patients from states that will restrict access to abortion. California Representative Barbara Lee, who is co-chair of the Congressional Pro-Choice Caucus, said Republican lawmakers are out of step with American views. Lee called Americans to make their voices heard and defend access to reproductive rights as protests emerge throughout the country. We're not going to be denied the right to make decisions about our own bodies. We'll not stop fighting until everyone, and I mean everyone, has access to safe, legal, and accessible abortions, no matter their income, their zip code, or their race. Nationwide protests are set to take place this weekend in cities across the country. Cities holding reproductive rights marches this weekend in the Bay Area include San Francisco, Fairfax, Benicia, Palo Alto, Mountain View, Petaluma, Brentwood, Sebastopol, Monterey, and Santa Cruz. In Southern California, protests will take place in Los Angeles, Long Beach, Claremont, Sherman Oaks, and Victorville. For KPFA News, I'm Avery Luke. And details on some of those protests that uh, in San Francisco tomorrow, 11 a.m. at the San Francisco Civic Center in Mountain View at 11 a.m. to 1 at 600 West Evelyn Avenue in Mountain View, San Jose City Hall, 11 to 1 p.m. in Los Angeles, the demonstration, City Hall downtown, 10 a.m. and in Fresno, 9 to 1 p.m. at West Knees Avenue and North 
Blackstone. The Texas Supreme Court is allowing the state to investigate parents of transgender youth for child abuse. But it was a mixed ruling today. The court handed somewhat of a victory to one family that was among the first contracted by child welfare officials following an order by Republican Governor Greg Abbott. In February, Abbott issued a first-of-its-kind order that instructed child welfare officials to investigate reports of gender-confirming care for kids as abuse. State child welfare officials have said they opened nine investigations following the governor's directive. Lambda Lego, which helped bring the lawsuit against Texas on behalf of the parents of a 16-year-old girl, called today's decision a win because it put the state's investigation into their family on hold. Meanwhile, New Mexico and 18 other states have announced plans to introduce legislation they say will be needed to protect transgender kids from civil and criminal penalties when seeking gender-affirming care. Roz Brown reports. The proactive response follows proposed legislation in Texas, Louisiana, Arizona, Alabama, and other states criminalizing such care. Havens Levitt with the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network in New Mexico says the dehumanizing language increasingly used to describe trans students takes a toll on kids' mental health. It's really heartbreaking to know that students hear some of the incredibly hateful things that are being said about them from adults. When our students in New Mexico hear those things, I know that it impacts them. At a press conference in California last week, a coalition of LGBTQ legislators, health providers, and civil rights groups, including representatives from New Mexico, announced plans to pass laws to provide safe havens for trans youth and their families. For nearly 20 years, New Mexico has had a law to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Three years ago, legislators also passed the Safe Schools for All Students Act, which required schools to enact anti-bullying policies. Nonetheless, Levitt says some areas of the state could use more resources to keep students safe. Transgender people have incredibly high rates of suicide attempt and completion. So then that just contributes to that sense of not belonging and not having a right to live the way they want to live and be who they want to be. Upon taking office, President Joe Biden reversed several anti-LGBTQ executive orders issued under President Donald Trump. But Levitt worries that with the new attacks, the fight for civil rights isn't over. There's so many things happening right now that feel like we're going to live in this universe of two Americas. It feels like we're going to be playing defense for I don't know how long, but it's definitely uh, not very comforting. There were more than 300 bills introduced that target the LGBTQ community nationwide in 2022, according to the Human Rights Campaign. This is Roz Brown, New Mexico News Connection. And this is the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.com. Org and uh oh, we're not doing so good. In fact, we're doing terrible. <laughs> oh my god. Two responses thus far. Two people making a donation, a contribution of any amount, it counts. Two people. That's 10% of our goal, which is 20. I'm sorry, we don't have anything besides the program that we're bringing to you tonight which is just the news. You can go online at kpfa.org or kpfk.org and find stuff if you want some stuff for your donation, but I'm not hawking any album or CD or book or video. Don't really have any other incentive than just the news. It is not working. I don't know what that says about the news or what it says about me or uh, maybe it says that people need some kind of incentive. I don't know. But let me give you the phone number. 1-800-439-5732. That's even toll free. It's not going to cost you anything. 1-800-439-5732. Save the, uh, the cost of the phone call and 
Give it to KPFA is your contribution. We're looking for 20 of you to do it. 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. And if you're listening to KPFK in Southern California, the evening news, the number to call is 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. The online address kpfk.org. KPFK. Dot org. Just two people thus far. Please help us out tonight. If you're a regular listener on Friday night, <laughs> please show us that someone's out there. 1-800-439-5732. The number to call in Northern Central California in the Southland. It's 818-985-5735. North Korea says six people have died. 350,000 have been treated for a fever that spread explosively across the country. The announcement today came a day after the country acknowledged its first COVID-19 cases of the pandemic. North Korea likely doesn't have enough testing supplies and said the cause of the fevers is unclear. South, South Korea says it will send the North vaccines and testing supplies. Experts have warned a COVID-19 outbreak could be devastating in a country with a broken health care system and an unvaccinated, malnourished population. Twelve Bay Area health officials say there's a new uptick in COVID-19 infections and they're urging safety precautions, including wearing masks indoors. The San Francisco Bay Area now has California's highest COVID infection rates, fueled by the highly contagious Omicron subvariants. Bay Area counties are seeing increases in reported cases, levels of virus in sewer sheds and hospitalizations. Officials say case rates are higher than those reported because of the widespread use of home tests. Health officers reiterate their continued strong support for people to mask up indoors, keep tests handy, and ensure they're up to date on vaccinations by getting booster shots when eligible. Health officials say people should also stay home if they feel sick and get tested right away. Officials also encourage getting tested after potential exposure and limiting large gatherings to well-ventilated spaces or outdoors. Health officials say medications are available that can reduce the chances of severe illness and death for those at high risk if they get infected. White House COVID-19 coordinator Dr. Ashish Jha has issued a dire warning that the U.S. will be increasingly vulnerable to the coronavirus this fall and winter if Congress doesn't swiftly approve new funding for more vaccines and treatments. In an Associated Press interview, Jha said that Americans' immune protection from the virus is waning, the virus is adapting to be more contagious, and booster doses for most people will be necessary with the potential for enhanced protection from a new generation of shots. Jonah Chester filed this report. A million people have died. It's such a terrible toll. And when you think of what it means in the lives of those families, the heartbreak continues. As America's COVID-19 death toll approaches 1 million, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is calling on her congressional colleagues to pass a new COVID relief package to address the ongoing pandemic and its fallout. President Joe Biden has ordered flags to half staff to mark the grim milestone. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says the president has a plan to address a nationwide infant formula shortage. These steps include cutting red tape to get more infant formula to store shelves quicker by urging states to provide consumers flexibility on the types of formula they can buy with WIC dollars. Saki says the White House is also increasing infant formula imports and is calling on states attorneys general to crack down on price gouging and unfair market practices. I'm Jonah Chester for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. Supply chain disruptions and a recent product recall have been connected to the baby formula shortage and the empty store shelves that parents are encountering. Mike Moen reports. Pediatrician Esther Chung says panic buys by consumers are at play too and that stores are having a hard time keeping up with demand. For those out of luck, she says some might try to stretch what they have by diluting the formula. 
She strongly advises against that. We would say that that's not safe, particularly for young infants, because it wouldn't give them the proper nutrition and it could cause health problems. Chung spoke on the topic through the University of Washington. She says a possible solution is to look for alternative brands sold under store's name. She says if you look closely, the ingredients are often similar to name brands. According to Data Assembly, South Dakota had an out-of-stock rate of over 50% in late April. Other experts suggest calling your pediatrician for recommendations on available products. Industry officials add that smaller stores and pharmacies might have more consistent supplies. And Chung says for older infants, parents can get a little creative with pureed food. The other thing that people have tried is taking pureed foods that they've made at home and put them in little ice cube trays so that, that way they can freeze these little mini meals and pull them out for later use. She stresses it's still important for parents to follow pediatric guidelines and not introducing solid food to your child until after four to six months. As for other things to avoid, she suggests not buying products through eBay or similar platforms, citing safety concerns. Mike Moen, Greater Dakota News Service. The House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis has released a report detailing how meatpacking companies worked with the Trump administration to change regulations so that their plants could stay open during the COVID-19 pandemic. The report says the meatpacking companies worked with the Agriculture Department to alter the worker protection regulations, allowing the companies to stay open despite health concerns and economic uncertainty. The companies cited in the report included Tyson Foods, JBS USA, Smithfield Foods, Cargill, and the National Beef Packing Company. Democratic Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina, the number three Democrat in the House and the chair of the subcommittee, said that the regulation changes were an administration-wide effort to force workers to remain on the job during the coronavirus crisis despite dangerous conditions and even to prevent the imposition of common sense mitigation measures. Tyson Foods, for one, disputed the claims of the subcommittee that exposed workers to danger through opposition to some regulations. According to the first report by the panel released last October, more than 59,000 meatpacking workers at plants owned by the nation's top five meatpackers contracted COVID-19 in the first year of the pandemic and at least 269 of them died. Industry executives argued at the time that domestic meat supply was threatened by worker absenteeism. The House report said those concerned were baseless. Small Montana meat processors in Montana are among those on the front lines against the large companies that control the industry. Funding from the American Rescue Plan is helping those processors compete. Eric Tagatoff has that story. $7.8 $7.8 million were secured for 30 Montana businesses from the COVID relief legislation. That includes $450,000 for Hamilton Packing Company in the Bitterroot Valley. Jason Schlange is owner of the business, which has been around since 1969. All of our stuff here, you know, it's a little bit older, so we're going to be able to get it up to snuff and do a little bit of expanding in the process. So we have a little bit more room for cooler and freezer storage, which is important. And we'll be able to upgrade our retail facility so we have a little bit more to offer. Senator John Tester led efforts to secure funds for small meat processors in Montana. He says consolidation among the country's four big meat processors, which own the vast majority of the market, is driving meat processors, ranchers, and other small businesses to close. Schlinge says the big four, Cargill, Tyson Foods, JBS, and National Beef Packing, can have an outsized impact on the market when they choose to. So if they kind of try and put their thumb on something, I think these funds are going to help a lot of smaller meat processors like myself to be able to take care of their local communities better. Schlange says supply chain issues from the pandemic have highlighted the importance of local meat processors to be able to continue serving communities, even as meat was in short supply at larger stores. For Big Sky Connection, I'm Eric Tegadoff. We're almost halfway to our goal of 20 contributors due during this newscast, thanks to contributors from... Uh, Campbell, an anonymous donor there, Forrest in San Jose, three 
people who did not want to be named, contributing from San Francisco. Okimos in, I believe, Michigan. Teresa in Portland, Oregon. Hector in Forest Knowles. And an anonymous contributor in Norwalk. We're halfway to our goal. Won't you please help us uh, along the way by giving us a call at 1-800-439-5732. We're trying to raise the money, keep this radio station and the news that this station provides on the air into the coming months. 1-800-439-5732, the number to call or online, kpfa.org and in Southern California. 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-5735. If you value the kind of news and information that you get on KPFK in Los Angeles, including this newscast at 6 o'clock, go to kpfk.org and be one of the mighty 20 making a contribution during the newscast tonight. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert. Every morning on Upfront, we give you a window into what's happening in your community and around the world. It's a mix of reporting, interviews, and debates where we ask hard questions and make room for thoughtful answers from City Hall to Ukraine, pretty much everywhere in between. Start your morning with Upfront at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! right here on KPFA. Israeli riot police today pushed and beat pallbearers at the funeral for slain Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akla, causing them to briefly drop the casket in a shocking start to a procession that turned into perhaps the largest display of Palestinian nationalism in Jerusalem in a generation. The scenes of violence were likely to add to the sense of grief and outrage across the Arab world that has followed the death of Abu Akla, who witnesses say was killed by Israeli troops on Wednesday during a raid on Jenin in the occupied West Bank. Simon Marks reports. The White House is expressing concerns about what it called deeply disturbing scenes today in the Middle East. They took place at the funeral of slain Al Jazeera reporter Shireen Abu Akla. She was shot to death in the West Bank earlier this week. Al Jazeera has accused Israel of her blatant murder. And today, Israeli troops could be seen beating and kicking mourners as pallbearers attempted to carry the reporter's coffin through the streets. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. I would say first that we have all seen uh, those images. They're obviously deeply disturbing. Uh, we, this is a day where we should all be marking, including everyone there. Uh, the memory of a remarkable journalist um, who lost uh, her life. Um, we know that there is, um, we, uh, with the disturbing footage from the funeral procession, procession uh, today in Jerusalem, we regret the intrusion into what should have been a peaceful procession. Simon Marks reporting. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas memorialized Shireen Abu Akla at her funeral today. His comments translated by Al Jazeera. Shireen... Today, we are here to pay our respect to Shireen Abu Akla, the martyr of Palestine, the martyr of Jerusalem, and the martyr of free speech and the free world. A symbol of the Palestinian women, a symbol of the Palestinian journalists, Shireen has sacrificed her life to defend its cause and the cause of the Palestinian people. The Israeli military says a shootout was underway some 200 yards from where Akla was shot in Jenin, and that without ballistic analysis of the bullet, which is held by Palestinians, it cannot determine whether she was struck by Israeli or Palestinian gunfire. The Palestinian Authority has refused Israeli calls for a joint investigation. It's calling for an independent one. Abbas reiterated that during Akla's funeral. We hold the Israeli occupation authorities fully responsible for her killing, and it will not be able to conceal the truth with this crime. This crime shall not pass without penalty. We would like to point out that we reject and have rejected the joint investigation with the Israeli authorities because it committed this crime and because we don't trust them, and we will immediately approach the international court. 
Israel announced an Israeli policeman was killed in new fighting in Jenin today. An Associated Press photographer heard heavy gunfire and explosions and said Israeli troops had surrounded a home in the city. Independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders this week held a hearing on Medicare for All at the Senate Budget Committee. He says the debate is not really about health care, but about corporate greed. What this debate has everything to do with is the unquenchable greed of the health care industry and their desire to maintain a system which fails the average American but which makes the industry huge profits year after year after year. While ordinary Americans struggle to pay for health care during this pandemic, and we'll talk about the impacts of the pandemic on health care, the six largest health insurance companies in America last year made over $60 billion in profit, led by United Health Group, which made $24 billion in the midst of the pandemic in 2021. The Vermont Independent has long argued that a single-payer system that provides comprehensive health care to all for free at the point of service would save both lives and money. In a statement, Sanders' office noted that estimates show Medicare for All could save 68,000 lives a year. Numerous studies find that Medicare for All saves the American people in the U.S. health care system billions of dollars a year. Adam Gaffney, assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, testified that medical debt is a unique American phenomenon. One in five U.S. households are carrying medical debt, which now exceeds all other forms of debt sent to collection agencies in this the richest nation in the world. Medical debt should not exist. And in many other countries, it basically doesn't. But the problem is not only families ruined by healthcare costs. It is worsened health due to inadequate care. Today, 30 million Americans are uninsured. These patients go without needed care day in and day out, and their health suffers because of it. In the ICU, I have cared for patients critically ill with failing hearts, failing kidneys, fluid in their lungs. Because they couldn't afford routine care for common problems like high blood pressure or diabetes. Senator Sanders, the chair of the budget panel is introducing an updated version of his Medicare for All legislation with 14 Senate co-sponsors. Elon Musk said today's planned $44 billion purchase of Twitter is temporarily on hold, pending details on spam and fake accounts on the social media platform. Stock in Twitter tumbled 18%. There's speculation Musk wanted to spook Twitter shareholders into selling, thus lowering the cost of his acquisition of the company. There's also speculation he's maybe having trouble with his financing for the deal. Meanwhile, Twitter has fired two of its top managers, the latest sign of internal turmoil in the company. Ira Spitzer reports. Twitter's CEO, Parag Agarwal, announced the departures of the company's head of consumer and its revenue product lead in an internal memo, noting that Twitter hadn't hit certain milestones in revenue and user growth. The changes come with Tesla CEO Elon Musk looking to complete his $44 billion buyout of Twitter, which he intends to take private. Musk reportedly has told the banks who helped fund the purchase that he planned to cut Twitter's executive pay in a bid to limit costs across the board. Ira Spitzer, San Francisco. And we're up to 12 contributors thus far. Just eight more to go. If we could get one per minute, we'd make it because we've got just about eight minutes left in this newscast. But you're going to have to do it now. 1-800-439-5732. That's the number to call. In Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. Or anywhere, you can go online, kpfa.org, kpfa.org. In Southern California, the number to call, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. A House of Representatives subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples of the United States held a hearing in support of Congresswoman Sharice David's H.R. 5444, 
the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act. That hearing came a day after the Department of Interior released a first-of-its-kind investigative report revealing that more than 500 American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children died at 19 Indian boarding schools in the country from the early 19th century through the late 1960s. Jonah Chester reports. A House subcommittee on Thursday considered testimony from tribal advocates and leaders on the long-term impacts of boarding schools for Native American children. The schools, which operated from the 19th through mid-20th century, sought to systematically strip those children of their cultural identity. James LaBelle, a survivor of the boarding schools, described to lawmakers how the system robbed him of his native language. I quickly suppressed my wishes to speak, in fact, because of the horrors I saw and witnessed when other children were uh, severely beaten for speaking their language. The hearing came the day after the Interior Department released a long-awaited investigation into the federal government's use of boarding schools. The report revealed from 1819 to 1969, the United States operated more than 400 such schools across 37 states. The investigation has so far found marked and unmarked burial sites at 53 different schools across the system. I'm Jonah Chester. Still stuck at 12 contributors looking for 20 by the end of this newscast. And we are running out of time, folks. We're really running out of time. Thanks to uh, anonymous contributors in Ashland, Oregon, Santa Cruz, California, and San Francisco. That got us to 12. Won't you please be number 13 on... May 13th, 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org or in Southern California, 818-985-5735, kpfk.org. Tomorrow is World Migratory Bird Day. Bird experts say it's a great time to be on the lookout for types of birds you may not see every day in your community. Lily Bolke has the story. Up to 300 species of birds have been identified in and around the Gulf of Maine during migration season. And this year's theme for the Awareness Day is the impact of light pollution on birds. Nicholas Lund with Maine Audubon notes roughly 1 million birds die per day from running into glass. At night, the lights from within make glass invisible to birds. And during the day, it reflects their habitat. Birds don't know what glass is, and so they fly accidentally into windows when they are drawn in by lights, which also may disorient them as they're traveling or draw in the insects that they're trying to eat. In addition to risks of collision, disorientation can cause birds to circle and deplete their energy resources, making them more vulnerable to predators. Lund recommends turning out lights at night during migration, which is now through the first part of June, and then again in September and October. He says if you can't keep your lights off, light fixtures can help, and you can treat the glass on your windows to make it more visible to birds. Lund adds that while Saturday is the day selected to celebrate migratory birds, millions of birds are flying up to Maine every night from their wintering grounds in the south looking for places to breed. The trees in your backyard are going to be full of colorful songbirds. The shores and the mudflats will be full of shorebirds moving. The sky is full with raptors. I mean, this is migratory bird month for sure. Lund notes that for folks who want some guidance, birders and experts are leading walks across the state, including at Fields Pond near Bangor on Saturday, as well as all this week and next week at Evergreen Cemetery in Portland. And on Saturday, staff naturalist Doug Hitchcocks will be doing a big day, trying to find as many bird species as possible from Bangor to Kennebunkport. This is Lily Bolke with Maine News Service. A former Tennessee nurse whose medication error killed a patient has been sentenced to three years of probation. Hundreds of health care workers rallied outside the Nashville courthouse today during the sentencing of Redonda Vaught. They said criminalizing honest hospital mistakes would lead to more deaths in hospitals because health care workers won't be as forthcoming. Vaught apologized to relatives of the victim and several said she shouldn't have to see they <laughs> jail time they want her to see her not jailed Vaught was found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and gross neglect of an impaired adult many nurses who blame systemic problems and say the risk of prison has made nursing intolerable Sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs near 90 degrees inland. Sunny and hot in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs 
in the mid 90s, sunny and hot in Los Angeles. Highs in the low 90s. 13 donors, we got that. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. The group made serious demands for five institutions to be established on Alcatraz. And why don't we have them yet? A Center for Native American Studies, an American Indian Spiritual Center, and an Indian Center of Ecology that would do scientific research on reversing pollution of water and air. A great Indian training school that would run a restaurant, provide job training, market indigenous arts, and teach the, quote, noble and tragic events of Indian history, including the Trail of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee. And a memorial, a reminder that the island had been established as a prison initially to incarcerate and execute California Indian resistors to U.S. assault on their nations. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1 KPFA.